and has recently completed his master's in management science from Stanford University Graduate School of Business. Welcome, sir. And sir will be speaking about inclusive teaching strategies for legal education. We request you to kindly share your insights, sir. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I thank RV University uh, for being such a wonderful host. I thank Manupatra for organizing this in collaboration with RV University and providing this uh, platform to speak about something that is uh, quite the need of the hour, but has very little focus been placed on it uh, in a systematic or programmatic manner. Of course, there is a lot of inclusive education that all of us have done contributed to in various capacities in our lives. Uh, I myself am the product of some inclusive education that was funded by Manupatra back in the day when I was at NLS Bangalore and I studied for four years uh, through the financial assistance uh, generously offered through the Manupatra scholarship there. Uh, so there are various such you know ways in which uh, supporters have helped uh, students like me and many others, you know, come within the fold of uh, legal education and of course the most uh, popular of such ventures is the one started by the late professor Dr. Shamnad uh, Bashir, IDIA, which all of us here I think are quite familiar with. Uh, so I think before I embark on uh, what we are doing at Vinayaka Mission and more generally some of the insights that our experience as educators have uh, given us uh, in terms of uh, weighing in on this uh, topic, I'd like to just set down some boundaries uh, as far as the uh, topic itself is concerned because inclusivity is such a vast you know idea i mean it it means various different things to different people uh, there is of course inclusivity as far as access to education is concerned there is inclusivity uh, in so far as gen the gender dimension of inclusivity is concerned uh, of course we speak about inclusivity inclusivity very commonly in the context of persons with disabilities and what what leads to more inclusive workspaces or educational spaces for them. So as far as I'm concerned today, I'll uh, confine it to two things. One, uh, inclusivity within uh, legal education and the second, uh, inclusivity in the specific context of learners with uh, obstacles on account of the socio-cultural and economic background from where they come. So I'm going to really focus on that because the gender question is a fairly complex one. I, I'm not in the best uh, position uh, to, to speak about that both in terms of the time that we have today and even in terms of my own competence to speak to it. Uh, nor, nor am I really an expert when it comes to persons with disabilities and the kinds of inclusivity challenges they face. Uh, as far as uh, students from weaker sections of society are concerned, I think that's something that we have been doing a fair bit of work at uh, Vinayaka Missions uh, uh, and therefore in a, in a better place uh, maybe to weigh in on that. But before I get to that, uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes just to really get to the heart of the problem itself. What is it that we are trying to solve for? Uh, because I think without that, you know, it all sounds very uh, nice on paper, uh, but the hard, hard work that goes into uh, inclusive legal education can only really come out if we uh, spend a little bit of time uh, deep diving into the kinds of challenges that we see learners uh, often confronted with and what we are then uh, trying to address in the uh, classroom. So this is just some of the uh, you know uh, work around inclusivity to, uh, to uh, higher education. Uh, as we know, it is part of the Sustainable Development Goals and uh, there is a lot of focus, uh, at least in paper, faced, um, in placed on uh, access to education, equitable education, and ensuring that particularly when it comes to higher education, uh, that many of our learners uh, have uh, you know, equal access to affordable technical vocational and higher education and that they are also guaranteed a certain degree of financial uh, success and that uh, higher education sets them up for all of that. Um, but uh, if you look at the data, and this is where uh, you know uh, we, we, we kind of have to look at to understand the problem in a uh, uh, more nuanced uh, manner, uh, and, and the moment you look at the data, you see that, uh, I mean, this is just a very, very recently released ASAR report actually, done uh, with specific focus on uh, rural education, uh, rural areas within various parts of the country. Uh, about a quarter of our students cannot even read. And these are students between the age group of 14 to 18, so this makes it all the more alarming. About a quarter of them cannot read even sec second grade level text fluently. 
and about 40% of them uh, cannot read even easy sentences in English. And this is particularly important when we speak about legal education because uh, as we heard through the course of today, a uh, lot of emphasis is on understanding the text because there is no running away from the text. I mean, we can all uh, play nice, uh, interesting videos, try to capture the attention, do whatever is required to uh, make the learner feel uh, you know, comfortable within the classroom setting, but you are not definitely setting up that person for success if you do not make them comfortable to handle the text because that is what a judge will expect you to do, that is what a, a law firm will expect you to do or any other potential employer will want you to do as your first skill when entering the workforce. Of course, from there you can pivot, you could do other things and so on, but this is the most important skill expected from a lawyer and if this is the state of affairs when it comes to uh, our uh, secondary education and at the point when they leave the 12th grade, if this is the kind of learner who we get, that, that makes the problem uh, far more uh, fascinating and challenging one to sort of take head on and try to solve for. Uh, these are some of the uh, interesting stats. Uh, we heard a fair bit about the national education policy and NEP 2020 uh, places a lot of emphasis on enrollment in secondary uh, you know, learning. Right, you are in secondary school. That is a uh, that statistic has to go up and become 100 percent. That is the aspirational vision. Uh, we are almost there, and we may get there in the next five, seven years. But what is also equally important to bear in mind is that there is something called a culture of learning within the household, and many of these students, unfortunately, come from households where that culture does not exist. There is an aspiration, but that culture doesn't exist. So you could aspirationally wish for a lot of things, but if that culture does not exist, one big challenge that it results in is that you have learners who are far less motivated than you would like them to be. So just a few years back, I decided on a whim to go and pursue a business school education. Uh, and yes, uh, quite a crazy thought. I took the GMAT <laughs> and I ended up at Stanford doing this one year program called the Sloan MSX uh, Fellowship. And uh, uh, b at the time that I did that program, uh, I, I was away from math for about, you know, uh, 15, 20, I mean, about 15 years and, and uh, had never really uh, done much when it comes to numerical thinking or uh, ability uh, or faculty of using my, the numerical side of my brain. Uh, but the difference was that I was a motivated learner, right? So in a classroom where many people were from finance backgrounds, were very confident with numbers, I felt absolutely le left out. Uh, but the difference is as a motivated learner, you're willing to put in the hours needed. But what happens when your learner is not motivated enough because they are not able to see where it all finally takes them, right? So that too is a big part of the challenge. A third important part of the challenge, and I specifically uh, single out Tamil Nadu for two reasons. One, that we are located in Tamil Nadu, but more importantly, because you often hear Tamil Nadu has done a fairly good job when it comes to school education. The bureaucracy is good. Uh, there has always been an emphasis, be it uh, the ADMK or the DMK, on promoting school education. But I can tell you this based on all the limited outreach that I've done in schools, that when the board changes from CBSE to uh, the state board, there is a drastic difference in the kinds of conversation and interaction that you have with students. Uh, where in the case of the CBSE learner, all my stories are met with a lot of laughter and there is a lot of engagement. In the latter case, it's almost like speaking to a bunch of people who have no clue what you're trying to say and they think it's a sin to ask you a question. So th the heart of all of this is something called teaching to the test, which we uh, heard a fair bit about. I, I respect uh, Dr. Patel for mentioning, particularly in the last session. Sometimes instead of letting people do what they're good at, you may basically create a compliance regime. And this compliance regime has unfortunately led to things like this, you know. Uh, you're, you're basically trying to prove that, look, your students are good. And how do you prove that? By making them uh, test excessively and teach them to the test and they pass the exams. And what do these poor kids do after that? They don't know how to frame a question. They think framing a question is a wrong thing. They don't have any sense of how to engage inside a classroom. So essentially, by the time they enter higher education, you have to, you, you're faced with this situation where as an educator, you have to not only teach them the law, but you have to teach them multiple other things, which is what I have tried to capture in this slide, you know. So it all starts with very low motivation levels. 
which also coupled with perceived language barriers because I don't think the many of these language barriers are actually real. They are far more perceived than real uh, as our experience uh, seems to indicate. The negligible reading discipline because of the fact that many of them come from uh, ho households where you know learning is not uh, taken seriously except as a uh, mode of earning. Right, it it can maybe be an aspirational goal at best, but uh, but not uh, seen as a substantive value in itself. Poor critical thinking on account of the rote learning that they, these poor uh, students are uh, exposed to, which all all of that combined to lead to dismal learner outcomes. So, what does it then mean to do inclusive legal education for uh, educators like me, my colleagues, four of uh, three of us, uh, uh, three of my colleagues are also here. Uh, and and uh, what what has it meant for us? And it, we are very young as an institution, especially when it comes to doing this work. Uh, uh, and it, it 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 is going to take far more time for for me to stand and say that you know we created something uh, actually unique or uh, new le legal education model or something. But these are some of the thoughts that I thought you know would be useful to share. And uh, it is for each of us as educators to take what uh, what matters to us keeping our institutional, respective institutional uh, contexts in mind. Uh, these are largely based on our own experiences. The first is that we feel that any sort of transformative toolbox that we are talking about in, uh, towards inclusivity needs to be rooted in learning science. Because otherwise, the, the term is very nice to hear. Like I said, it, it looks very attractive on paper. But unless you bring in a learning science element to it, more of which I'm going to speak about very soon, uh, you're not really going to know whether you are on the right track and whether you are achieving the intended outcomes and delivering value to your uh, student, the ultimate uh, stakeholder. Right, so it has to be rooted in some uh, some learning science, you know, theory, some uh, ideas, well-established ideas and paradigms of learning science. The second is that bilingual support is a very integral element to this. You are not going to uh, be able to do inclusivity without uh, accepting, first of all, that most of your learners think in a language other than English. So unless you provide the kind of support. Uh, it's 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 all well and good to say, look, I'm giving you some English classes. Uh, it doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work in terms of taking that learner to a point where he or she becomes a motivated learner and feels comfortable to ask questions in the classroom. So you need to start with bilingual and get to a point where over time you wean them off, you know, whichever is the regional uh, language, at least this has been our experience, that it takes a good two years to wean them off in a five-year program. By the time they are in the third year, you can probably have full instruction happening in English. Of course, all the evaluation, everything at Vinayaka Missions happens in English, but you have to provide that bilingual support early on. The third is the confidence building part. You have to do a lot of leadership work, a uh, lot of personality work, development work, because the fundamentally, again, you know, because of the way that they have been taught in their schools and made to think about uh, education, made to think about the teacher and the dynamic between the teacher and the student, you have basically a bunch of students who not only are uh, underconfident speaking about things uh, uh, themselves, but are also in some ways uh, uh, come in with that mindset that if a classmate shows that kind of confidence or courage to dis dissuade that individual. So there is a very strong herd mentality that operates, uh, which I'm sure operates everywhere, but it operates in a, a very acute and rather negative uh, manner uh, in, in settings where uh, you have learners who uh, come from uh, this uh, segment of society. So you need to do a lot of work towards making them realize that asking questions is a very positive thing. This is, in fact, what they are going to be paid for, pay, paid for as, as professionals once they enter the workforce. So you need to keep you know, figuring out ways to tie it back to the end goal, which is to you know, find a meaningful job, to do things you know, uh, which are meaningful as law professionals, and to tie it all back to the habit of being more confident in the classroom, to ask more questions, uh, to open up, to speak up, and so on. And finally, uh, I, I mean, I believe that all such work towards creating an inclusive education uh, toolbox has to finally track and measure everything that you do. There is no uh, real result uh, or real intervention even without measurement. You have to measure. And that's not something that uh, 
as uh, lawyers, we are often very comfortable doing. As legal educators, we uh, think it is, it, is, it is fine to sort of be a passionate teacher, put in our best, but the more important thing to ask is what are they getting out of it and how is this working out in real time? Uh, by that, what I mean is any kind of intervention. You can start a new leadership program, for instance, but you need to also know where is it really going. It's not enough to launch it because, you know, there are many such initiatives uh, we have seen even at Vinayaka, uh, we launch and having not done too well. Uh, the difference is, I think, because we are committed to this uh, project, uh, we try and uh, keep a three-month or four-month window where we pilot and start you know, evaluating, and then if it's not working, we scrap it. There's nothing wrong in admitting to failure because uh, this is also the kind of project where 90% of the initiatives that you launch will fail. It's that 10% that will get you some degree of success, and hopefully that will then take you to a better place, take your students to a better place as, as you go along, and that, that's what you mean by better learner outcomes here. Uh, so I'd like to spend a few minutes on the learning science part of it. So one of the things that uh, we believe uh, uh, you know, uh, has a lot of value when it comes to making uh, inclusive education uh, successful is acknowledging that you cannot teach them uh, the syllabus entirely. Uh, you cannot teach them many of these nuances of the fast uh, changing world that we live in today. Uh, they are going to grapple with challenges when it comes to technology. So with all these you know, challenges that they face, what is the best way you as an educator can he help them, equip them, while ensuring that there is, the, there is that limited bandwidth within which you operate, which can then be spent in the right manner. And one of the uh, learning science you know, uh, insights that we have relied on significantly is the learning to learn paradigm. Uh, uh, which has uh, you know, found acceptance in a lot of academic literature. Uh, and what that essentially means is three things. The first is that you need to feel as, as, as though you are the owner of that learning process. right? If, if you are not the owner of your learning process, you are never going to find success in this model. Uh, I mean, we have had uh, very uh, you know, uh, interesting uh, uh, examples where there's a lot of work put in. After two hours as educators, we feel, wow, that was such an amazing session. But at, at the end of it all, it's going back to square one. We have felt that in many instances, you know, uh, when launching new initiatives or new ways of evaluating them and so on. And then we realized that those learners inside the classroom who came in with that very clear view internally that, look, this is my learning journey and this is what will lead to XYZ result. They did a lot better than the others who also liked the session, who said, oh, you know, sir, you're putting in a lot of effort and this and that. But ultimately, it is like writing on water. You're not going to get the requisite results unless you uh, get them to take ownership over their learning. There are uh, techniques, methods by which you can do that. Uh, I mean, I'll speak a little more about that soon. Uh, then, of course, the second is you developing your own skills and strategies for learning, like, for instance, time management, note taking. So we have to spend a fair bit of time with our students, helping them with these things, which in some uh, settings, it's almost accepted that this, the learner comes with all of this, right? In, a, in, a, in an elite uh, legal uh, you know, education institution, you, you will not question the ability of your learner to take notes, for instance. Right, but uh, here we have to qu begin by questioning it, and then go to them, reach out to them, and find out, you know, what are the challenges they face when it comes to taking notes in the classroom, uh, when it comes to revising, going back home, and you know, doing revision. I mean, so it, it is very one-on-one -on -one type work. It's it's not really uh, very complicated. Uh, I mean, when I say it, but when you do it, it it can uh, be sometimes, you know, uh, very time-consuming and demanding. Uh, the final part is, of course, how do they reflect? And on their learner journey, right? Because if you really hope that teaching them how to learn is going to lead to better results than teaching them X, Y, Z content, then you also need to give them that understanding that the way that you learn today may be 20% you know, optimal, and it could get to 60% optimal if you reflect on your learning journey. So you need to also make it an integral part of their being. Uh, their, their time, the way they spend their time in the classroom and outside, that they reflect on it, they evaluate, and they then iterate. They go back to taking more ownership. They go back to you know revisiting some of the skills and strategies that they are putting to use. 
The other part of the learning science that we found very useful is uh, looking at some of the literature and Professor John Hattie in uh, University of Melbourne has done some remarkable work here on what are the parameters that have uh, demonstrably worked inside classrooms by way of interventions that make a difference to the life of the student, right? And one of that uh, particularly struck us uh, early on as being very important, which is the collective teacher efficacy part. Uh, so what that then means is that it's not about one law teacher, it's about a team of teachers who are really working to solve a problem. And this uh, model is uh, not an easy one to achieve because uh, we also live in a world where there are individual parameters of success for teachers. Uh, there are various research goals and so on and so forth. So within that kind of setting, with that limitation, uh, how do you create this? And collective teacher efficacy is not a new phenomenon or any anything like that because any time I speak to, for instance, my former professor uh, VVK, who was uh, right here in the last panel, uh, and he goes back to the early days of NLS. NLS was built as an institution on this very principle of collective teacher efficacy. This is exactly what Mother Menon did, right? And Professor Menon at that uh, time felt that, look, unless you have a team of committed teachers, you're never going to build this new paradigm in uh, legal education. So I think any new paradigm or any sort of mission-oriented uh, institution needs that kind of collective teacher efficacy. So it begins with the hiring practices, and some of this, of course, may be less relevant to uh, uh, the, the legal educators here, may be more relevant to the uh, you know, leadership team. But I, th I still think it's important to kind of see this, uh, because we are, we are doing this on a, on a uh, you know, semester basis at least. Uh, and and uh, what, what, what I mean with, uh, fr from that is, uh, there is a tendency often to just look at individual brilliance and hire people, and uh, I consciously have taken a call uh, to avoid that. Uh, sometimes we lose out on very good uh, people because of that. But uh, the, the reason is that the mission is more important than the individual, uh, whether it's me or anybody in my team. And we believe that what that then means is you have to hire as a team. And, you'd, and usually I even prefer doing it as a full hiring round of certain number of people. And then you, you are able to better see at least part of that picture. Right? When you're hiring one person, you're evaluating that one person against the institutional goals and so on. And sometimes a person falls short, but may be very good as a researcher or something else. Right? So if you're hiring as a team, it makes it a lot easier because sometimes you have that cushion to go with somebody who's an amazing researcher, but who may be less committed to that uh, classroom interaction, but you then balance it out with the rest of your team. So the hiring practices become very, very important when you're trying to do anything uh, that, that uh, claims to uh, you know, be committed to inclusivity. Uh, you need to also have very regular conversations with your faculty, going back to the vision of the institution, the, what, what this means. And of course, groupthink is a very important element again. Uh, because the reason I say this is that uh, you cannot achieve something uh, like this. I mean, solving for a, pro for a problem like this unless you trust your faculty. And in, in the, inside the classroom, they really are, uh, each of them are the people who have the autonomy, who have the freedom to do what, what they think is right. And often what we have seen in faculty meetings is some of them are doing really uh, you know, exceptional work, but we don't get to hear about it as a collective. So we made it a practice that you know we share pedagogic practices more regularly, and that group thing then leads to uh, a better way of understanding what are the things that are working, what are the things that are not working, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, peer learning is, for instance, one, one such idea that we, we really uh, uh, d deploy in the classroom because one of our faculty colleagues had done it quite effectively. Because even within our students, there is a range within which their language skills exist and other skills exist. So you can leverage on some of these uh, students who have those skills or come with a higher degree of confidence, higher degree of felicity of language and so on, and then make them sort of lead the classroom discussions and uh, so on. Uh, the research culture part is important because more than the research output at this stage, uh, when it comes to our inclusive education model, what we are trying to uh, inculcate is a, is, a, is a culture where you ask more questions, where there is more thinking by our faculty. Of course, uh, Ananyo, my colleague, is here, and uh, he has done some amazing work in terms of uh, driving some of these ideas around uh, a LinkedIn research page that we launched, we started getting a lot of uh, interest and traction. Students too started, you know, tracking it. Uh, 
uh, and that then leads to this uh, you know uh, next level of uh, uh, asking of questions by the students, right? So we, we need to really push a lot of that. And finally, you know, of course, telling every faculty that they need to bring something to the table when it comes to inclusive education because this is the core mission. On bilingual support, the first element is, and this really is very critical because often we think that we know best, right? And to tell them, oh, you know, you need to learn all of this. How can you handle legal education unless you have a strong command over English, for instance, and then often, you know, the response is, sir, I don't want to even go practice in the high court. I want to build a career for myself in the lower courts. And, you know, I'm very comfortable speaking in Tamil. So please tell me why I should really learn all of this in English. And often you don't have a good answer to give that learner, right? So you need to know what you are doing uh, with the learner in mind. And, and uh, not, not that, of course, you then tell them you can completely ignore learning law in English, but you need to uh, sort of communicate that point in a different way, which is that it makes you, you know, communicate in a, to a wider audience. So this is not about your identity. It's not about something that you feel good or bad about. It's about, you know, what makes you uh, more successful as a professional in terms of how you can reach out to a wider community, peer group learning, which I already mentioned. The third is translation technologies have been proving to be quite useful. Suhasini in the earlier session today uh, spoke a fair bit about integrating technology and inclusivity is an area where technology can be integrated very well. Of course, so long as you know what you are building for. Uh, various innovation incentives exist within our organization for those who uh, you know, bring in pedagogic innovation into the classroom. And finally, yes, I have felt that this is quite useful to have young people who are trained in Tamil Nadu, many of them who share stories very similar to the students we have that often helps because they connect a lot with such uh, faculty and th these guys are, uh, they serve as influencers, right? So that, that also really helps sometimes to make them take the learning process a uh, lot more seriously. Uh, of course, these are all points that I already sort of touched upon. The, the element of leadership, confidence building is very critical to making them those learners who learn to learn, right? Because th this is the only way that, that they can take up that project by being, uh, feeling more confident. And finally, the tracking and measuring part, because I genuinely believe that learning science is a science. I mean, while it draws upon multiple disciplines, the psychology and other areas of uh, uh, you know, other disciplinary insights included, but I think finally it is a science, so you need to figure out ways by which you can measure these initiatives. Evaluation itself is a great way to know where you're going with things, because often, you know, you can try out an intervention in the classroom, have a quiz, have multiple other evaluation strategies deployed in the classroom, and then you can see how well they are faring before or after the whole, you know, way by which you can create sample groups and see, uh, like any social science uh, research. Uh, and I, I always believe that the learner self-reflection is a very important part. That is the qualitative one that you will sometimes miss out if you focus only on the quantitative elements of how they were before and how they are now. Because finally, you also need to ask the learner how they feel about their education now. Like how do, did some of these initiatives really work, right? So after any, you know, uh, workshop or anything that you do, basically running a feedback form, and understanding both quantitatively and qualitatively how that worked out for them. Uh, this is just a little bit about us. Uh, this is how the institution is at the moment. There is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, first generation graduates, as you can see, because we have the three year program as well. Uh, and of course, many first generation five year uh, program students. Uh, we have very specific initiatives for some of these interventions that I spoke about the communications and English language lab, and there's a Tamil center, which also helps with translating legal materials and so on. And of course, there's a lot of professional expectation alignment, which is needed, uh, especially because learning for its own sake is something that may not necessarily resonate with the crowd. Uh, this is uh, done by one of our faculty colleagues. I thought I'll share some of our classroom experiences. Uh, so role play works, uh, Nishant is here. And this is something that he had done in the classroom. Uh, he comes uh, he from outside Tamil Nadu, cannot speak a word of Tamil, but he picked up the word Aruwal and has clearly put it to good use inside the classroom. Uh, so these are you know, some of the ways in which you can connect with learners who are from a different state, who come from a different background, et cetera. 
these are some of the things that have worked. Internships certainly work, provided the, those internships are with committed internship partners who understand from where these learners are coming. In fact, I had a very recent, uh, you know, run-in with a with a, an internship partner who said, you know, oh, your students came and they were part of a much larger crowd, and then they dropped out of the internship. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry. And she said, no, I am sorry. I should have realized that they are coming from this place and that I need to create a different, you know, pathway for them to make the most out of that internship. So those are the kinds of internship partners we need for this model to succeed. So if somebody says, look, they can't, uh, you know, uh, cre create a legal notice on day one, then yeah, maybe they're not the right internship partner for us. We'll have to uh, sensitize them as well. And that's part of my responsibility, our team's responsibility. But inclusive education is a joint project. It's not a you know, one person driving it or one institution driving it. The other thing that we find very useful often is, uh, while they don't have many of these skills, and I spoke a lot about that, I uh, do a lot of disservice when, uh, to them because some of them are extremely capable students. There are guys who are running like biryani sh shops. There are guys who are uh, Amazon, I mean, sorry, Apple, uh, you know, iPhone uh, distributors. They're doing the three-year program and learners at this point, we are young as an institution, so we are also able to do this a lot better. So what, what uh, really struck us is that many of them come with this, uh, you know, wisdom from the street, right? They've, they've dealt with so many practical problems and handled so many challenges, far more than I had when I went to NLS or any of our, my colleagues, uh, you know, had handled. So we try to draw upon that and send them out to the world you know, and do a lot of things. And they recently did a very important, uh, you know, legal aid uh, work uh, camp with this Irular community in the nearby, you know, village. Uh, I mean, uh, so this is a community that is uh, memorialized through the movie Jai Bheem. And, and these sort of stories also resonate with them because they see, you know, acts of heroism. They see acts of, you know, uh, service, right? In all these uh, things from popular culture that you rely on. So you need to stoke the pre-existing knowledge that they have, you need to stoke their love for popular culture, the things that they connect with rather than throwing your hands up in the air and saying, oh, they can't speak English, right? I mean, that is, of course, a challenge. I'm not denying it, but there are many strengths that they come with. Though, though, so the moment I, uh, and all of this is organized by these kids. Huh? They don't, like, rely on us for most of this stuff. They go all out and they can hustle their way through life. They can get bus passes. They can do whatever is needed to make things happen. So I, I think, you know, I mean, we, we live in a kind of uh, society where, you know, yeah, there is a lot of emphasis on placements and the corporate sector and so on. But I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, if the state comes knocking at your door, I mean, the enforcement directorate or whatever the powers that be, these may, might be your uh, people to go to, you know, they might be the kids who will stand in the way and fight for your rights because, I mean, they come from a very different, uh, you know, strata of society with a very different uh, appetite for taking risk. And that's quite amazing. So if we can make them good lawyers, why not, right? So that really is it uh, from my end. I mean, I'd just like to say that inclusivity has to run across the value chain when it comes to uh, any, any institution doing this work. By that, what I mean is from the point of admitting your students to nurturing them to hiring your faculty to creating the right kind of internship partners and opportunities across the value chain, you have to take this seriously because otherwise, you know, the strength of the chain is only in the weakest link. Uh, th we are thinking of a bridge course that might help, uh, you know, even before they come to campus because this is something that a lot of uh, universities uh, do abroad and even here I think some uh, have started this. Uh, as far as technology solutions are concerned, I would end with the cautionary note that, I mean, there's no point in uh, signing up with a very expensive vendor and doing this. One also needs to customize it based on the kind of inclusivity that one is trying to achieve within the organization. Uh, collaborative structure is very important. And finally, uh, where do you get find the money for it? I don't have very many good answers for this. Uh, you know, CSR is something that uh, we are also exploring as an institution to go in that direction so that over time, at least a bunch of these initiatives can be funded through CSR, if not the whole uh, law school. So that really it is. And uh, I know that many of you here in this hall have done amazing things on inclusivity. So if, we, if time permits, I'd just like to hear some of your uh, comments and thoughts about what you have faced in your classrooms. And I'm sure there is something that we can learn from that. And I'm, I'm just curious and looking forward to that. Mm -hmm.